Hello you guys, so I hope you guys are ready for my January January reading wrap up video and yeah let's just jump right in. I read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books and I'm gonna go in the order that I read them not in the order of how good or bad I thought they were and yeah so let's start. So I read the book called The Beauty by Aaliyah Whitley. Whitley? Whitley? And this is a story of a dystopian future where um, all the women have died and all that remains is men. And through some kind of weird thing, I don't know how to explain it, um, all of a sudden the place where women were buried, uh, these mushrooms kind of start inhabiting um, the remains of these women and then eventually actually turn into half women, half mushroom hybrids and then they start up having relationships with um, these men that are remaining, and uh, I was definitely drawn to the fact that this was such a unique and odd story. Um, this book really plays on the idea of gender roles. I don't really want to give too many spoilers on what happens, but it really does. It's kind of like, what is the role of women? What is the role of men? Uh, are they interchangeable? If we start interchanging them, do we lose the actual concept of men and women? And is that even a bad thing or a good thing? I guess that depends on how you read it or read this book. Um, the writing is great. Uh, the storyline is definitely unique. Uh... At times, it really creeped me out. It was, it was like there were certain, especially sexuality-based aspects to this book where I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about the graphicness of it, and yeah. But I do think it's an interesting idea, and you know, if you are somebody who's really into gender studies and all this kind of stuff, I think this would be an interesting book for you to read. Uh, yeah, for me it's a C. It's not good. Oh wait, sorry, three star. It's not good, it's not bad, but yeah, it was interesting. And then I read this big old fatty here. This was what I was reading on my flight to the Maldives and then finished it on my flight back. And that is Parasite by Mira Grant. This is my second novel I've read by Mira Grant. She does a lot of horror-inspired literature. I actually really enjoy her writing. I think she's a really gifted author. Uh, basically, the storyline here is, again, it is sometime in the future, and this pharmaceutical company comes out with this pill that has a bioengineered tapeworm in it, and this tapeworm... Uh, can regulate a lot of aspects of, of your life in terms of, you know, it can make sure that you're only getting the right nutrients and it can help eat up all the bad, you know, free radicals or whatever, I don't know, whatever you're eating and stuff like that, that is bad. And then it help and I don't know, somehow sim symbiotically, it like helps keep you healthy and all this kind of stuff. And it's seen as kind of like this new wonder drug and, but then something happens where, uh, and this is not a spoiler, it's pretty much in the very beginning of the novel, it might even be in the synopsis, and then what happened, then, but what is now happening is that these tapeworms, because they are like super tapeworms, they actually start taking over the host's body, and yeah, so... Very similar to the other book I read by Mira Grant, which was called Feed, I think. It was about zombies. 
this book had a lot of potential for me. The thing that killed Feed for me was, that even though it was a zombie book, it almost felt like a, this is the lifestyle of a reporter book. Like, she spent more time talking about the equipment and reporters having to do this and reporters having a check in there. And that was all kinds of stuff that didn't interest me. Like it wasn't, a, didn't make it a bad book. It was just, it didn't follow what would have been my interest in the book. So this book was very similar. I found the first half of it riveting and the first half of it probably would have been a five star for me. But what I was hoping is that this was going to turn into yet another zombie kind of book where these tapeworms they take over this per the people's body and turn them into zombies and then it's like a double whammy they have to worry and people have to worry about maybe the tapeworm that they've ingested if they did take this pill taking them over plus they have to worry about zombies like that that kind of would have been interesting to me but what ends up happening in the book and i don't really want to say this like the twist of what ends up happening was just not interesting to me at all. Like, actually, I would even go so far as to say that I thought it was really dumb. And that just kind of killed the novel for me. Like, after halfway through, I really had to push myself to continue reading it. Because I was just like, I did, personally did not like the direction that this novel was going. If you do enjoy the direction this novel is going, then... I think you will love this book because I do really enjoy the writing. I definitely think she's somebody who just like hook and sinks you, hook and sinks you, catches and sinks you. I don't know what that saying is. Um, yeah, so if, if you enjoy Mirror Grant's twists, then I think you would really like this book and it's a trilogy and you'll probably even want to carry on the trilogy. I, however, did not like the twist and because of that, I am finishing it. I'm not finishing the trilogy. Uh, yeah, considering half of it was great and the other half I didn't care for, I'm going to give this a three star as well. All right, then I read the second part in the Broken Earth trilogy. So the first part was the fifth season. Uh, the second part is The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemison. This was the book I actually wanted to take with me on my vacation to the Maldives. Because I was after I read the fifth season, that was my, the best book I read last year. Hands down, it's not even an argument. That was an absolute five star. I loved it. And even though there was parts that really became predictable to me. Like, I don't want to put any spoils, spoilers. But, yeah, the... I loved it, and I automatically, I went online, and I ordered it, and I was like, okay, please, 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 Amazon, please send it before I go on my vacation, but it didn't, so I ended up having to read it when I got back, and here's the thing, this, um, N.K. Jemison is just an amazingly gifted author, I cannot fault her in her writing whatsoever, and I don't really know why, because this was this is actually a really good book, but I don't know if it's just like the middle book syndrome, and it's mostly just like filler, filler, filler. Nothing really happens. Um, considering that nothing happens, she still manages to make this book relatively interesting, but I will have to say it's kind of a letdown compared to the fifth season. I mean, the fifth season, I was just like, oh, man, this is amazing. And then I read this one, and I was like, all right. You know, it was definitely not like the fifth season where I really did not put it down. Like, I just blew through it. This one was like, all right, I'm tired. I'll read some more tomorrow, you know. Um, I'm still going to give it a four star because it is amazing writing. And considering it's just a builder book where she kind of just gives more information, does more world building, all this kind of stuff. It is actually very well written. It's just not the Tour de France that the first book was. Then, actually I'm going to do these two last. The, so I read two books, but we're going to skip those really quick. Then I ordered this book offline. It's called Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. And the premise of this book is that we are in the Civil War era, or maybe just like right after the Civil War, actually probably in the Civil War era. And 
think it was in the Battle of Gettysburg or whatever. I'm sorry. We're not super familiar with U.S. history in that way. Uh, the people that died in that battle were reanimated as zombies. So you guys probably can already tell I'm really into zombies. From all the different horror genres, like I'm not into vampires, I'm not into ghosts. You know, I'm going to read anything that's going to be zombies. Um, and basically in this dystopian past, if that is such a thing, uh, the former slaves are now being trained to be zombie killers and protect the white slave owner people or whatever. So we follow the main character whose name I forgot, uh, and she goes through the training to become a zombie killer, and then she's trying to get her first assignment to be like the protector of some random southern white woman. But all kinds of stuff happens and blah, 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 blah. You know, so the story uh, unfolds. Um, so the plot itself I thought was stupid. And I, it's really simply written. And I do think this is definitely, I mean, it's a YA book and you can't expect great literary prose from a YA novel. But it was it was just really the writing was just not interesting to me at all in this book, and the plot was meh. Uh, the one thing I will say is that this book it really touched on a lot of things again where I was just I'm finding this is more and more a trend, and if you're somebody who doesn't want is not interested in any kind of political views or whatever. But this book, once again, just really talk, kind of really did this whole thing again where, you know, white people bad, non-white people good, you know, and I just don't, I actually, I think this book handles that topic better than some of the other books I've read. And I mean, having it take place in Civil War era times, I can understand where, the white man was the bad man. I mean, like, they, you know, so, but I just, I get a little tired of this narrative in this day and age. It's just so, like, everybody's doing this, and everybody's like, yeah, white privilege and white people are bad, and I, I, I'm just, I just get tired of it at some point. Interestingly enough, though, um, at the expense of, you know, how dumb white people are, and obviously the black people were the heroes in this novel, and also Native Americans. And after I finished this book, I was actually kind of interested in seeing if I could find negative reviews on this book. So I went into like YouTube and I looked up negative reviews. And the only negative review I could find was actually from this Native American guy who <laughs> really tore into this book and was saying how it really misrepresented Native Americans and... I don't know, he had like, and, and, and well, anyway, the point, this is not really related to this book anymore. The point that I thought was really interesting is it kind of relates to what I was saying in terms of, this is very political, so if you're not interested in the political aspect, let's skip ahead to the next book. But this book handles black people's struggle and Native American people's struggle so well. So well. I mean, like, uh, even though I got a little tired of the constant, like, all white people are bad kind of crap, uh, I do think it was, it made sense for this book. And I don't think that um, the black struggle or the Native American struggle were on top of the already kind of, like, negative white people suck also were overly victimized or overly put in a position where it's like, oh my god, everything, it was just so unfair to us. Like, I thought that part was handled really well. And I, I, I can tell you right now, there was nothing in this book that in any way, shape, or form was racist against Native Americans. And that YouTuber was just crying and complaining and saying, like, how um, Justina Ireland was like really offensive towards Native Americans and how dare she write about Native Americans. And if you guys kind of follow my channel, you know, I talk a lot about how I don't understand, 
I'm not part of the liberal platform and I don't really enjoy the liberal platform. And I thought that video to me was the epitome of the thing I keep saying that doesn't make like liberals eat their own. So it's kind of like you have this minority group, black people, you have another minority group, Native Americans, and both of these are represented so well in this book and they're made out, they're the heroes, they're the ones who are like the good guys, the ones that are doing, they're like working hard and doing all this kind of stuff. And then still somebody who's Native American rips into this book and complains and says how it's not fair and incorrect and and they actually told me because I because I met and left a note then and I was like can you tell me exactly what it is that makes you think that and they were like oh you need to read the author's note and then you'll know everything about how um, rude she is and how inconsiderate she is to Native Americans. I'm kind of tempted to read the author's note now. Should I do it? Yeah, I'll read it really quick. Just skip ahead if you're not interested. So the author's note, this is what the author's note says, okay? Um, I felt I would be remiss to end this story without telling readers that the events of this book are based on actual historical occurrences. The United States did have a system in which Native American children were sent to boarding schools where they could learn to be civilized. Beginning as early as 1860, whites would remove native children from their homes and send them to boarding or industrial schools. The point of these schools was to destroy na native culture and force natives to assimilate into white or European cultural norms. The most famous is the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, established in 1879 in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I moved the timeline up a bit to account for Mr. Redfern's education there, but its existence is real. It is now Carly Barracks, a U.S. Army post, and I first visited the base in 1999 and was amazed at the murals in the gym that depict Olympian Jim Thorpe, a Native American from the Sac and Fox Nation who attended the school at the turn of the century. I've never heard of Native American boarding schools before then, and in the abstract, it seemed like a pretty cool thing. However, when I attended a master's program at a nearby university some years later, I was able to visit the Carlite Historical Society and learn the truth about Indian schools and the Carlite Indian Industrial School in particular, how they broke up families, erased native culture, victimized vulnerable children, and hired our students out students for back-breaking labor to nearby farms and households in a system that was eerily reminiscent of chattel, chattel or cattle, I don't know how to say that word, chattel slavery. This exploitive school system became the basis for the fictional combat school system in the alter alternate historical timeline for Dread Nation. Because if well-meaning Americans could do such a thing to an already wholly subjugated community in a time of peace, what would they do in a time of desperation? I encourage everyone to read further on in the Carlisle Indian Industrial... What is this called? Um... Uh, sorry, Indian boarding school. I'm including a list of books I found helpful and that I have seen recommended by native scholars, blah, blah, blah. So, like, just reading this author's note out loud to you guys right now, you can see that this book is in whole support of Native Americans and actually even trying to create more Native American awareness by saying, look, have you guys ever heard of these? I never heard of that either. So I actually learned something more about how Native Americans were subjugated during that time in American history. And the Native American guy that reviewed this book actually went on a rant and said, how dare she use the, this industrial school as a base for her fictional book of the boarding schools that these black people had to go to to train to kill zombies. I was just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, I mean, it's just like you're going out of your way to be offended people. I, I just... I don't get it. Alright, then the last book I read this in, in January was The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. And this again takes part in Civil War era. Uh, the storyline here is that uh, two slaves are escaping from their plantation in Georgia, and they do so via the Underground Railroad. The twist in this book 
is that the Underground Railroad is an actual railroad system, um, which was actually the part that thought I was like, oh, wow, that's an interest to me. That was a funny twist because like from the limited amount of American history I got in Germany, uh, when I would hear the term Underground Railroad, I actually assumed it was a railroad. And I just thought the concept of like them going on a railroad and, you know, that was actually what drew me to the idea of reading this novel. But surprisingly enough, that was the thing that most people didn't like. If, if you read the, the feedback on this book, uh, the negative comments are generally by the fact that people didn't like that they, he made it into an actual railroad. After having read the book, I can understand why people would feel that way. Because the book is, other than that aspect, very true to what was going on in the South at the time. There's no like magical realism otherwise. There's no other there's nothing else about it that in any way, shape, or form makes you think, ooh, something some kind of fictional twist to this. Like otherwise this seems like it could be a real story. But so it just seems odd to have that one aspect be added and it's so incredibly fictional that it's just kind of it's a little it it, it, it feels a little bit silly in the context of this book. If more aspects would have been like magical realism and stuff, then I think it wouldn't have bothered readers so much. Uh did I say what I gave this? I'm giving this a, I'm giving this a two star. And, uh, I don't know how I feel about this book. So in this book, like I said, I got I was getting a little bit tired of you know white people bad, everybody else good. But at least for the most part it was handled well and it was written well. So I kind of was like, alright, you know, and to be fair, in this time and this in when this takes place, it makes sense in the context, so I was like, whatever. This one, though, was it was too much. It was just too, too much. I mean, um, oh, I think I cut that up. Um, this was just too on the nose for me. Like, it was just so white people bad. White people will always be bad. I think the book even ended on something like there will always be a war between the white and the black man. And, you know, it, it, I, it, I just can't, I just, I'm just, no, I, the thing is like, I'm just somebody, and this is something I, this is not even a liberal or a Republican or a left or a right thing. This is just something I just generally don't like in life is that if the only way you find you can build yourself up is by tearing other people down, I'm just generally not into that, you know? Yeah. And this book felt really much like the only way we can make it seem like black people have any worth is by saying that white people are worthless and white people are terrible and white people are evil. And I just, I feel like you can, you can put it within context and see, okay, what, what was happening in America at that time is unjustifiable. Um, it was done by white people as far as that was even a thing in those days. Uh, so all that I don't have a problem with, but I don't feel like you have to create a, a storyline where it's like, why can't white and black people both be good and both be misunderstood, like do bad things at times and do good things at times? And, you know, why is it kind of like... Yeah, I, I don't really know. I don't really want to get too into politics in a book review, but I just, I don't like the idea of the only way we can make black people look good is by pointing out how incredibly shit white people are. And I'm like, why can't black people just be good and white people be good and Asian people be good? And again, I know you guys are probably thinking like, oh yeah, this takes place in the American Civil War. That doesn't really make sense within the plot. If you read the book, you will see that the author... Um, Colson Whitehead, <laughs> Whitehead. <laughs> um, <laughs> you will see that the way a lot of things are written, it's it's not just there so that the plot makes sense within the time frame, 
but also to bring across his personal political ideology, which is white people are shit. And I don't know. So having said that, I think the writing is better in this than in Dread Nation. So I'll give this a three star. Okay. Whew. Sorry. And I told you guys that my reading theme this year was going to be nonfiction books. Uh, I'll do this one first because I didn't like it as much. So the second nonfiction book, I was originally thinking I'm going to do one nonfiction book a month, but then I, the, one of the best books I read last year was a nonfiction book, and it really kind of got me on this idea of nonfiction. It really interested me. Uh, so the second nonfiction book I read in February was Essays by Arab Women Reporting from the Arab World, are women on the ground, uh, and there is every section is by a different writer or author. Actually, for the most part, these are all journalists who happen to be of Arab descent. Didn't like this book at all. So, uh, from what I read online and what made me buy this book, I actually wanted to read about the day to day Arab woman living in like Saudi Arabia and her talking about what struggles, if any, she faces being a woman in Saudi Arabia, uh, what her life is like, and then do the same thing for Iraq and the same thing for Yemen and the same thing for Egypt and the same thing for Turkey and, okay, Turkish people aren't Arab, sorry, uh, Syria or whatever. That I think would have made a really compelling and interesting novel to get the viewpoint of this. What we have here though is uh, women who are of Arab descent, but the vast majority of the women writing here are journalists that grew up in either the U.S. or Canada or Britain, had a very Western upbringing, then might have been in the Arab world working as journalists for a while, and then them kind of like top down saying this is what life is like in Arab countries, and... And living in the Arab world myself and seeing how women are treated here, I felt a lot of this was really offensive. Uh, I did a video where I talked about, you know, I, don't, I honestly don't believe that every Arab woman or every Muslim woman, you know, that I don't think that she's beaten or subjugated or treated terribly. No, no, I don't believe that at all. But to create a book in which all they're doing is saying how the Arab women are so strong and they are so powerful and they're equal to men and they do all these things. And I just kind of was like, this is just a straight up lie. Like, it's kind of like Arab women who are born and raised in the Western world, they go to these countries for a while, only show and write about the aspects that they felt will support uh, liberal people's ideas of Islam in the Western world. I just thought it was offensive. There was only one person's unit that I liked, and it was this woman from Yemen, and she actually was from Yemen. And it was also the only chapter that I actually wrote about how difficult it is to be a woman in Yemen and all the things that she has to deal with. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. The only woman who actually comes from that country and lives it every single day is the, also the only one who says about how difficult it is. And all of these America and British and Canada-born Arab women are only going like, wow, oh my god, you, you have to be so lucky to be a woman to live in Saudi Arabia. I mean, like, I wish I could move here, which of course they didn't. So, the writing was good. <laughs> Did not care for the essays at all. I thought it was, I personally think it's really offensive to all of the women in this, this part of the world who actually really have to deal with subjugation and being a second-class citizen and the struggles that they face. Yeah, so that to me was just a two-star. And the other book, and the last on this, sorry, it's already a really long video again. This is called The Tastes of Paradise, and this is by Wolfgang Schivelbusch. That's how you would say it in German. I have no idea how you would say that in English. And a Social History of Spices, Stimulants, and Intoxicants. So this book is basically about what were the crazes in terms of culinary 
delights or stimulants or whatever during a certain era. So maybe in the 1600s, I think the very first chapter is pepper. I think pepper was like, let's see. Uh, coffee, sorry, the very first one is coffee. Um, so they talk about like in this in this era coffee and then this era pepper was a big deal and then this era spices were a big deal and this era I think opium was like a big deal. I loved the idea of this and I actually got a lot of information and overall this was a very interesting book. Uh, the only thing that I would have liked is maybe more subsections of different spices, of more different kinds of things, maybe even bring it into the current time, you know, saying like, this is when cocaine became an, an issue, this is when this became an issue, this is when, I don't know, sugar-free sweeteners became a thing, whatever. No, I think that would have been, or if, and then if it had been broken up by decades rather than by uh, what it was that was used, because pepper was just too long i mean like it was like people use pepper in this way and then pepper went over here and then pepper was put in these dishes and these six dishes tasted miserable pepper i was just like oh my god let's get past pepper already like you know and he i i mean there's really only five things that are discussed in this book i mean it's a pretty thin book but i'm like you could have made it like 15 things made every section like 20 I guess I was kind of thinking this book was going to be similar to the one about colors that I showed you guys in my I think December or November wrap-up where like they talked about it was all about like where the different colors come from every everything was like two or three pages and it was just kind of gave you the most general idea of it like this color was first discovered in India and it was made out of these two things it became fashionable in this country for this kind of purpose and it lost fashionability at this point in time and i was like good that's all i need but like this one is like and then there was the war where pepper all of a sudden became just as important as thing and then they had to after the war only these people ate pepper and then there was this man and he told the story about pepper and then you have to read the whole story and i'm just so i think it should have just been edited differently but conceptually i like I'm going to give this a 3.5. Okay, sorry, this was crazy long. That is the end. Uh, I'm really looking forward. This year, definitely, I'm going to do a my favorite uh, books by black authors for Black History Month, which is now in February. So look, please stay tuned for that book review, which is hopefully going to be coming up in the next couple of days. All right, take care. Bye.